Well, first of all, I want to thank UConn Talk for inviting me. This is a wonderful opportunity for me to be able to tell you a little bit about what I do. Uh, I think many people are often surprised that there is a state archaeologist, that the state would actually hire an individual to oversee archaeological research and preservation in, in the state. And I know a lot of people, when they think about archaeology, they think of Egypt and Rome and Mexico and Peru and hardly think of, well, Mansfield, Connecticut. But anywhere people have lived, anywhere they've raised their families and adapted to the conditions of the environment uh, through different technologies through time, um, well, they've left remnants of that occupation and settlement in the ground that eventually gets part of what we call an archaeological record. So we, um, uh, we preserve that. And when we're talking about Connecticut, we're talking about an archaeological record that goes back 11,000 years ago when the first Native Americans came here. Uh, after the, the glaciers left and the land opened up and became fertile and allowed for human occupation uh, into the area. Uh, my office is with the Connecticut State Museum of Natural History uh, here at UConn and Archaeology Center. And if you ever get a chance, we're right next door to the UConn Co-op. Come on in, in, in and say hi to us. We'd love to show you our exhibits. And we have some of the most amazing anthropological collections uh, anywhere in the Northeast. Uh, our collections are in the millions of specimens. And, and rival any collections uh, uh, available. We make those collections available to researchers, and we also make them available to uh, uh, you know, uh, um, exhibits as well as public programs. So uh, we do a, a great deal at the museum uh, in public outreach for the university and in telling the story of environmental and cultural uh, resources and how people have lived here. I, um, I've written into actually 11 sections of the state statutes with roles and responsibilities. Um, so every now and then the state legislature decides this is something that can do and uh, we, uh, we get written into uh, state laws. And they pertain to everything from you know, preservation, research, um, curation, uh, and so forth. What I do is I maintain an office of archaeology. We have over 8,000 archaeological sites listed in our files. And again, those go back from the earliest sites of Native American occupation into the colonial period, into the industrial period with water-powered industry, and really into the 20th century. In fact, uh, the state of Connecticut gives me authority to preserve and protect archaeological sites that are 50 years old or more. Uh, that, that, that actually means that about um, 14 years ago, I became eligible for the National Register of Historic Places, you know, <laughs> because I'm well beyond that limit. And I always wondered if you ever get to the point where you actually excavate sites that are, you know, that are younger than you are, you know, <laughs> and, and it's very possible. So we, uh, we, we protect everything right into our own lifetimes. Um, in fact, I worked a few years back on um, um, a World War Two plane crash. You might be familiar with it, even though you don't know it. Uh, a Lieutenant Eugene Bradley in August of 1941 was doing training, top gun dogfights, and lost control of his plane, came vertically down uh, into the ground at, in, at the air base at Windsor Locks, uh, and was the first fatality there. They eventually would name the airport after him. So I'm sure many of you have gone and flown through Bradley International Airport and had no idea why it was called Bradley. It's Bradley because Eugene Bradley um, gave his life for his country uh, and was the first fatality there. The issue was, uh, after 60, 70 years, people had forgotten. We had no records as to where the trash occurred. And using ground penetrating radar and actually a search that included five years, we finally found the site, uh, the crash site, and, and documented it for uh, uh, the state of Connecticut and the Department of, of Transportation. So we're, we're doing archaeology not only for thousands of years ago, but, but uh, uh, into um, really our lifetimes. Um, probably the most interesting things I get involved with are forensics, and that is to say forensic archaeology. Um, state law says that whenever human skeletal remains are uncovered in any capacity, must be reported to the police. And it's up to the police and the medical examiner to determine whether the bones are old, part of a historic grave, or whether they're part of a modern criminal investigation. If they're 50 years old or more and part of a grave, then uh, the, the investigation is turned over to me as the state archeologist, where I then um, will do not only the, uh, the archeological removal if necessary, but oversee the historic uh, um, um, research um, and also try to define uh, descendants of these people. 
If they're Native American, we work very closely with the Native American Heritage Advisory Council and all five uh, extant Native American tribes in the state of Connecticut. They advise me as to the proper handling of the bones in terms of their spiritual beliefs, but also how they should be reburied. Um, and uh, if they're colonial, we do uh, document research to try to determine if there's any descendants uh, available to help us and assist us uh, in making decisions about these remains. So the dead are always represented by a contemporary population in some sort. I also, however, um, uh, get involved in modern criminal investigations. Uh, and while I have no real statutory authority for that, I'm often called in by uh, the state police major crime squad or municipal police departments whenever they suspect buried uh, murdered victims who um, they were buried to hide the bodies or uh, skeletal remains that are found that may be modern uh, and we assist. Uh, I have no statutory authority for that but um, often called in to provide technical assistance and we're pleased to do so to, to help bring closure to, to some of these very uh, um, emotional cases uh, that happened. In fact, you might not even think of it, but uh, archaeologists have been part of disaster teams at the federal level. Whenever there's a major plane crash in the United States, there were archaeologists at 9-11 when our uh, nation was attacked uh, uh, at the World Trade Center. Um, I have colleagues that have been working in Vietnam and uh, Korea and other areas of the world um, trying to recover the remains of uh, MIAs, uh, soldiers that are still missing in action, trying to provide closure for families that are waiting. So you probably don't think of archaeologists in that role, but we, we do lend our specialties, if you will, what we've learned uh, in the role of forensics uh, and bringing closure to contemporary social issues that affect us, uh, both natural and, 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 and cultural disasters. Um, so those are the, probably the most interesting things. We uh, get involved in a lot of different things. Uh, as was mentioned, uh, we got involved uh, with a research project to identify a cranial vault fragment that the Russian government had that was suspected to be that of Adolf Hitler. It was um, recovered in 1946 out of Berlin, actually the Reich Chancellor Garden, where uh, Hitler's remains had been found. Um, it had a bullet hole, if you will, coming out the back or somebody that had been shot in the face or, or, or in the mouth. And um, it was burnt, because we know Hitler's remains were supposed to be burnt to cremation, so nobody would ever identify him. That didn't happen. But anyhow, we were able to uh, determine forensically that it didn't fit the profile of Adolf Hitler. And then uh, bringing samples back here to the University of Connecticut, working with Dr. Linda Strasbach um, uh, at the genetics labs here on, on campus able to determine that the, the skull actually was that of a woman. And so uh, clearly uh, eliminated the, the possibility of, uh, of it being uh, Adolf Hitler. I've also been involved in some very interesting repatriation projects. Um, we had a couple of cases where two young men of native origin uh, died here in Connecticut, a uh, long way from their homeland, uh, one of which is uh, a gentleman uh, by the name of Henry Opukaia, who is, uh, in fact, a native Hawaiian. He left the Hawaiian Islands when he was a, a, a young teenager around 1803, and he came on an sail, American sailing vessel, came to New England, actually was adopted somewhat by Timothy Dwight, who was then president of Yale College in New Haven, and he became a Christian, and he decided that he um, wanted to devote his life to going back to the Hawaiian Islands and convert his fellow natives to the Christian gospel. Unfortunately, he died in Cornwall, Connecticut, uh, in um, um, 1818 due to typhus fever at the age of 26 and was buried in the graveyard there. Um, another, the other gentleman was uh, uh, an Ogala Lakota Sioux by the name of Albert Afraid of Hawk. Albert's father actually fought with Sitting Bull against George Custard at the Battle of the Little Bighorn. And um, Albert was actually touring with Buffalo Bill's Wild West show here in Connecticut in June of 1900. Uh, got food poisoning, botulism, and died in Danbury, Connecticut, and was buried in an unmarked grave in Worcester Cemetery. Well, going into the 20th century um, and the 21st century, uh, their descendants, their family clan, uh, petitioned the state of Connecticut to individually in 1993 with Henry Opakaia uh, have their remains uh, removed from Connecticut and brought home to Hawaii. And I was uh, instructed uh, as the state archaeologist to exhumed the remains, do the forensic work, 
uh, and provide for the reburial. And just last year, the family of Albert Afredo Hawk um, uh, asked us to remove his remains and be brought back to the Pine Ridge Reservation in South Dakota for repatriation. In both cases, two women in the family, contemporary women, um, had dreams that their respective ancestors wanted to come home. And to fulfill those dreams, which are very sacred among Native peoples, they, um, um, they requested the repatriation and we had the responsibility uh, of bringing them back. And what makes these a powerful stories is not just the archeology span or the forensic or the history, but what really makes it a powerful story is that we're dealing with contemporary people today who are using their past as a means of uh, um, you know, not only bringing an ancestor home, but understanding their cultural traditions, to understanding their heritage in a new light, uh, which is very powerful. I sometimes feel that as Americans, we are so caught up with the latest technologies and advancements that you know, we're, we're so focused on the future that we forget the past very quickly. History becomes old fashioned, it becomes irrelevant. It's like, who cares? Who cares what happened here in the 17th century? It's so far removed from me. And yet the answer is it's not removed from you. You are the past. The past gives you identity, social identity, and hopefully gives you self-esteem, but it identifies who you are. And so the reason we preserve archeological sites is not simply to save arrowheads. What we're interested in is saving cultural heritage and because it's so important to contemporary people. If you don't know your past, your family's past, your state's past, your nation's past, then you have no context in which to put your life. And that's what's important. And that's why archeology span and history is so important because it's us and uh, it's something we should never ever forget.